back from over two months hiking across the Greater Caucasus Mountains. It was unbelievable. I went through Russia, Georgia and Azerbaijan hiking alone through high mountain terrain. Had everything, snow, um, crazy bushwhacking, deserty kind of arid mountains, loads of cool shepherds that I got to hang out with. <laughs> and um, the Russian special police like following me around. It was an adventure. I've got loads of footage to edit, so hopefully people will watch some of that when it starts coming out. It'd be cool to share some of my experiences. But yeah, today I'm just going to really quickly go through what I took with me and what I used. Mainly because it all stinks and I want to wash it, but if I don't do this video now, I'll forget exactly what I had and how it packed and everything. I'm obviously willing to do more detailed kit stuff if people are interested. I know it can be a real help and it's not many people have hiked in some of these places, so it's probably a bit of a unique um, kind of kit list in some ways. But yeah, let's just get started. Um, one of the things I've got is this cool Soviet era ice axe which someone got for me. So before I delve into things, I mean, the, the gear you bring is dictated by a lot of things, but mostly the weather and the terrain and maybe the durability of certain items because you're out there for a long time and things like that. It was quite difficult to really get a very precise idea of the conditions and stuff that I would face just because there's not a lot of English language information out there for places like the North Caucasus in Russia where I was, I knew there'd be snow and difficult terrain and um, potentially big storms and a lot of wet um, river crossings and things. Whereas as I went further east and moved to the south side of the range, um, the weather became a lot drier and hotter as well. So it was difficult to um, really scale things down too much because it was quite a wide temperature range and things like that that I was anticipating maybe having to deal with. As far as temperatures went, I had uh, everything from 35 degrees when I got to the bottom of the mountains at times, down to like nighttime temperatures that hovered just above freezing. I was actually quite lucky, I think, with the night temperatures. They never went quite as cold as I'd anticipated. But yeah, I had some, some rainy, cold, windy days and yeah, some very hot, dry conditions to deal with as well. Right then, so this is the bag I took. It's a Gossamer Gear Kumo. I think it's about 36 litres. It's frameless. And I got this just before my trip. And I don't know, in all honesty, I think I probably should have just stuck to the bag I've always used, which is a ULA Ohm 2.0. It's actually just over here. So this is what I've traditionally used and it's an amazing bag. I've used it for five years on loads of long trips and it's barely got any signs of wear. It's got a very simple looped frame that gives it more stability and really gets the weight over the hip belt and the material is just generally really durable but more importantly the capacity of this thing is considerably bigger than this bag but it's maybe not quite twice the weight of this bag but it's considerably heavier and I never really have ever needed the full capacity of it so I was quite kind of tempted on this Caucasus trip to scale down so that's what I did and I got this too. The problem was I think for 90% of my trip, this generally felt a bit overpacked considering what I was carrying and the amount of food I had to carry. I think really if you're going to use this bag, you need a shelter that packs away smaller than mine did and you probably would want to go stoveless or just not have to carry much food or clothing, but I, I did unfortunately. So, But yeah, anyway, so this is the bag. My base weight was probably just about 6.2 kilos I think and um, I often had to carry four days worth of food, five days worth of food. I generally carried about a litre of water just in a normal plastic water bottle so I was probably carrying yeah like 10 to 12 kilos a lot of the time and this being a frameless bag it didn't carry as nicely as my ULA, but it was okay, it was comfy, it was good enough. It was just annoying that 
it was always just a bit of a mission to get everything packed in. You really had to use all of the space available really carefully, which is more efficient, I suppose. But, but yeah, okay, so let's just start with what I've got in the bag. Let's start with the outside of the bag. Um, some water purification tablets, easy to reach. I did also have a Sawyer Mini squeeze filter, but the flow rate, I had to filter a lot of water and the flow rate started to annoy me. So these backup tablets I had, I ended up using a lot of them. A couple of collapsible Avenue bottles. Um, they're great because they pack down to nothing, but when you need that extra water capacity, they're there. And you can use them with the squeeze filter. I had some little gaiters which I never needed because I never wore shorts on this trip and I'll talk more about that in a minute. I had some gloves that were waterproof and slightly insulated. Um, a lot of people would see it as overkill but if you've ever been out and the weather is really windy and rainy and cold and you're somewhere exposed and you need to use your hands to navigate and things <sighs> For me, like it can be, it feels really dangerous when your hands get too cold, and um, it's really important that you can maintain um, some warmth in your hands. So I took them. My main waterproof, like my waterproof coat, is the Outdoor Research Helium Two. Wicked, lightweight waterproof jacket. It's all I've ever really used. All I've ever really needed. Thought about bringing something heavier duty on this trip but I'm glad I didn't because the weather was so dry for a lot of it and it was good enough for when I did have wet weather. This thing weighs, I think, maybe around 145 grams, 175 grams maybe. It's light, like it's about as light as you can get for a waterproof. Had some really cheap waterproof trousers, ever so cheap, they cost like five quid from just a generic sports shop in England, they're not really waterproof, but they're good enough. Again, some people wouldn't bother, but when it's really cold and windy and rainy and you're not gonna be able to get out of it, it can make all the difference for me to just feeling that little bit safer and um, comfortable. It's not about staying dry, it's about staying warm enough and dry enough to, to keep going. Uh, I kept with them this little waterproof sleeve, which I could put my phone into. I used my phone for navigation. I had backup strip maps and a compass, but um, just the nature of where I was and the maps available and my limited map reading <laughs> skills, I was heavily reliant on my phone for navigation. So this just provided an extra way of keeping it dry um, if I needed to navigate in the rain. Um, so that was great, it weighed hardly anything. So that's the outside pocket done, things that were easy to, to get to quickly. This is the Sawyer Mini filter. So, top of the pack, it's just some cheap polarized lens sunglasses. They were amazing, especially when there was snow everywhere and it's really bright, but also when there was like clag and fog and mist they almost helped me see through that better sometimes which was surprising and obviously a lot of sun so i, I kind of lived in those sunglasses they were great i also had some sun cream in the top here that i could get to quickly just like a little bottle of factor 50. i kept most of myself covered so it lasted the whole trip easily just on my face my ears um, my hands anything my neck i also had this brand new device mainly because my parents made me buy it because they were scared and um, this is like a personal locator beacon so it's a Garmin inReach mini it basically tracks my location every two hours it would ping my location via satellite to a, a map online which my family could see but you can also do loads of stuff that you can pair it with your phone and you can send text messages when you have no signal. You can get weather reports on it. I'll definitely have to do some kind of in-depth review of this, but yeah, it was, it was really handy to have, really cool. In these two amazing pockets here, I would have my phone in this one, which I'm currently filming on. And in this pocket, I'd have my miniature tripod, which I'm currently filming on, but I'll show you those separately in the hip belt pockets i often won't wear the hip belt because it didn't really seem to do much with this bag probably because there's no frame but i would just use it for the pockets or i could detach it if i wanted to 
But yeah, just like what we've we got in here, some sweets. This little stick pick lets you turn your trekking pole into a selfie camera stick thing. That was cool to have. In this pocket, I generally kept my Luco tape. <laughs> this roll of Luco tape has lasted me like five years. Um, really good if you get a hot spot or a blister, just stick this over it. Really good to have it in reach so you actually can be bothered to use it rather than waiting too long. Man, <laughs> this info is so filthy and disgusting. I need to wash it. Okay, let's uh, open up the bag next. Okay, so going into the top of the bag, first thing I'd have is my fleece. Really good, this thing. I've had it like, I don't know, two, three years, and it's a Patagonia R1 hoodie. Really good mid layer. It's got a hood. Very warm for what it is, but it can breathe well if you start to overheat in it. And it's just really important to me to have this. Lots of people don't bring them, but I think it's typically uh, like American hikers who are hiking in much more, what looks like to me, like benign weather conditions where you're not dealing with a lot of wet and cold while you're hiking. But in Europe and where I was going, I definitely was. So it's really important to have an insulating layer that can cope with getting a bit wet. And sleeping in this thing as well is lovely. I would always sleep in this in my tent. Um, so yeah, that would go at the top where I can get to it quickly and fill out the space in the bag. Then I would typically have just some kind of shopping bag like this. And in there, I just have like snacks for the day or maybe like my spare pair of socks if I was planning to rotate the socks throughout the day. Just other things I want to get to quick. A bit of it's rainy. Just something like this will keep them dry, so yeah, great. Then I have my stove set, my kitchen, which is a 900ml titanium pot, spoon, um, meth stove, didn't need that, couldn't get meth, so ended up leaving that somewhere. Had a little fold out cup, that was great for my morning coffee, weighs nothing, packs down. Great. The stove I used on this trip was this little tiny titanium gas stove. It's a BRS 2000T or something. Works really well actually. This control valve sometimes played up but it was generally okay. Um, just went a bit wild sometimes. And I have one small gas canister, 230 grams, and that lasted me the whole trip because I was only really boiling a little bit of water in the morning for porridge and coffee. This is just the cone, like a windshield for the stove. And yeah, that's that. So then I would have my dry bag here and this just had like my electronic items, stuff like that, passport and everything that I really needed to keep dry. Big power bank, 21,000 milliampere hours, whatever. Charge my phone like six times maybe. Really important because my phone was my camera navigation and entertainment for the trip. Also, I had another phone with all my maps on as well because my GPS was so critical to navigation, I wanted a backup. I wanted to be really safe in these places where there's no mountain rescue or anyone around. And my, it's hard to get paper maps a lot of the time. So yeah, I had another GPS. Little Petzl E-Lite head torch. Batteries lasted the whole time. Didn't really need it much. In here, passport, various documents and bits of paper that you end up acquiring on a long trip abroad like this, bit of currency, compass, a couple of these for my phone and battery charging needs, headphones, don't have it out now, but yeah, just like a mini USB lead, phone charger lead, spare lighter for the stove, bit of money. And okay, I should probably talk about this. So, my phone, uh, when I ran out of memory on it, I had this little device, which plugs into the phone, put an SD card in, and you can back up all your stuff onto SD cards, which enable me to, to keep filming the trip and not running out of date like memory. In this little pot, spare batteries, some Imodium. Luckily, I never needed that. <laughs> Some spare SD cards just in that little pot there. This was like my first aid, wash kit, hygiene, all of that. Toothbrush and toothpaste, sun cream, 
hand sanitizer in the toilet roll. Got a little knife. That was really handy. The scissors on there, I used them for loads of stuff and just the odd little bit of cutting you need to do. Scissors for cutting my nails, opening things for repairs as well. Needle and thread full of blister plasters, some like painkillers and stuff like that, some tablets, KT tape, never needed that luckily, if you get like a muscle injury it can feel quite nice. This is great, this stuff, this is Gewol foot balm, so if you're dealing with a lot of um, wet conditions on your feet, you put this balm on in the evening and it makes like a waterproof coating for your feet almost and that your feet don't become all like pruney as quickly, really nice. This has got like super glue in and some um, seam sealer stuff which I used on my shoe repairs and things like that really good I also had a tiny little spray kind of deodorant just for when I wanted to feel more human and dignified um, when I was around people who didn't stink like me next food bag I've just chucked some stuff in here to simulate the weight and bulk of a general food carry um, but there's no actual food in there anymore tent pegs I use mainly these MSR mini groundhog temp pegs. They hold really well, I like them. I had a Cuban fiber ground sheet for my tent. This is the outer layer for my tent, which is the top tent notch. They've just brought a Cuban fiber one, but this is a Sil Nylon, amazing tent. I've had this since I started hiking like five, six years ago, and it's still going strong. Got a lighter shelter, but I took this because I didn't want to have anything too flimsy up in the high mountains. Um, had some running shorts, which I never wore. This is the inner layer to my tent in here, just in a little Cuban fiber bag. And the rest of the stuff is within a uh, big rubbish bag to keep it dry. Thermarest Neo Air mattress. This went faulty and turned into a giant bubble. Really disappointing. Needs to get that swapped, get it replaced. In here, got an amazing down jacket from a UK company called PhD Designs, Peter Hutchins Designs. This is like 260 grams but it's really warm, like down to minus, just under zero degrees, I suppose, centigrade. Um, especially if you, you're moving a bit, but yeah, really warm and light. It's like a thousand fill power down or something crazy. So yeah, I left this in Tbilisi at a hostel after Russia because I the, the weather just wasn't cold enough to really need it after that. Nearly there now, in here was my quilt. This is a Katabatic Gear Palisade sleeping quilt um, just in a Cuban fiber dry bag. And this thing is very warm. It's 900 fill power down, I think, or I got the 850 with hydrophobic treatment. And this is meant to be good down to zero degrees and it easily is. And I'm quite a cold sleeper but especially with all my clothes on, like my fleece and that, this is, yeah, amazing quilt. Really comfy, really cut nice, stays under you, no drafts, lovely. So yeah, the only thing left, spare socks. I use the Darn Tough wool socks, really good, really durable. And I had some Patagonia Long Johns, um, not just for warmth, but to keep the inside of my quilt clean if I was dirty. That is everything in the bag done. Okay, next let's just do what I was wearing. So for this trip, I've always just worn running shorts, but for two big reasons, I wore trousers on this trip. One being, uh, I really thought the weather would be too cold for shorts a lot of the time, especially at the start in Russia with all the snow and everything. Secondly, I was going through a lot of places where people are basically Muslim and in a lot of these places it's considered um, very rude for men to show their legs in shorts. Everyone wears trousers and obviously the last thing I wanted to do was offend anyone. So yeah, I wore these. I went for the lightest, thinnest trousers I could find, which were these North Face 
Tansa pants, I think they're called. It's like really thin, kind of stretchy material. And these were amazing. I thought I'd like, as soon as I got up into the mountains, I'd just throw these off whenever I could and wear shorts, but they actually breathed really well. Uh, they didn't feel too hot at all. And considering how thin the material is, I think I got one hole near the end from sitting on a rock or something. But other than that, they're fine. They weigh nothing. They weigh like 200 grams of that, I think. And they've still got zip pockets, two side zip pockets and a back one, which was great to have pockets. Running shorts don't generally have that. And a nice little belt included on them, which was low profile, didn't like rub on my hip belt or anything, worked really well. So yeah, dead happy with them. Actually converted to hiking in trousers, I think. Kept my legs cleaner so I didn't have to get all dirt and on my other clothes and quilt at night. On my top layer, <laughs> I wore this Rab um, Miko long sleeve. It's very lightweight. It's a merino wool and something else blend. I think merino and poly blend. I've worn this before on the Pyrenees high route and really liked the material and um, but it just wasn't durable enough on this trip. The shoulders just made massive holes. They just disintegrated basically. But apart from that, like it's good material, but it's just not durable enough for something like a trip that length, I think. And it's quite expensive. So yeah, won't be, won't be taking that again on <laughs> something like this. It got so tatty. Uh, for underwear, I just always wear these really cheap compression shorts. They're just a synthetic material. Really comfy, durable, don't really smell much. They're not near your head anyway, so you don't smell them. Dry really quick, so you can wash them easily. Yeah, just one pair of them. A pair of socks, obviously. I would wear this altimeter watch. Quite a cheap Casio one, but it's it works really well. As long as you keep it calibrated fairly regularly, the altimeter is accurate on it, it's good. Got my lucky hat, I would wear this. It's really showing its age now, but it's been everywhere with me. But yeah, obviously, hat really good for the sun. So yes, on my feet, I would wear these, the best hiking shoes I've ever had. And I'm nearly out of pairs now. They don't make them anymore. They're Ciccone Peregrine Fives. And yeah, they're just wicked, like really good solid sole with a rock plate in, but low profile, low drop. Um, the uppers are pretty strong and I reinforced them with seam grip to help with that. They've lasted really well. I did have a spare pair that I posted ahead, but I never even used them because these were holding up so well. The only part that really suffered were the inner soles. Had to repair them a bit with gaffer tape and that, but yeah, great shoes. Really comfy and light. Love them. I use trekking poles. These are wicked trekking poles. They're called pacer poles, they're quite unique. They don't have a straight handle and a strap. They have this ergonomic handle, which is really good because you, you can use them properly, but you don't have to have a strap around your wrist. So it's really quick to get them in. If you need to use your hands to balance or something, you can just quickly put them in one hand and do what you need to do. And I just find them very comfortable to use. They do a couple of brand, like a couple of models. These are the carbon fiber ones. I'd always use the heavier ones, but these are still really strong. They're twist lock, but they don't slip much. Um, yeah, they work really well. And they held up my tent as well, obviously. So yeah, awesome poles, made in the UK, Pace poles. I've not got any kind of endorsement with this company at all, but they've been so good in the past. Like I had a tip split in the Pyrenees and within a week they'd posted out a replacement free of charge. Just really good customer service. Seems to be run by um, like a couple, Heather and her husband, I think. And yeah, Heather Rhodes. And yeah, just lovely people. Really recommend these poles. Other than everything I've covered here, there were just a few other things, which were the crampons and ice axe that I had. So the crampons, they're kind of the lightest crampons you can get for trail runners especially they're petzl leopards they're not steel they're only aluminium so obviously if you're going to use these on rocky grounds they're just going to they're going to get blunt really quick so you've got to be careful about the way you use them but yeah they're ever so light under half a kilo and yeah they just fit onto running shoes they just have a bit of dyneema cord between them 
rather than like a metal plate, um, which keeps the weight down, keeps them really packable. On this trip, I was really stupid. I decided not to bring my ice axe with me because I had like people saying, you're probably not gonna need it. And I didn't wanna go carrying an ice axe around all these towns. Um, it just felt a bit conspicuous <laughs> given the circumstances. So yeah, like I suddenly, I was in Russia in the middle of nowhere and I needed an ice axe and I was staying with this awesome family at a hotel and they got me one. So yeah, the guy got me this and this is like a really old Soviet era ice axe and um, I, I used this to go over a high pass in the snow and I took it home as a souvenir. So I had this as well. So yeah, that's, that's everything I took. Um, I've probably forgotten something, but I don't think anything significant. Generally, everything works really well, except obviously my shirt, which fell apart, my thermos, which broke, and my bag, which is probably a bit too small for what I was carrying. And the temperatures were just generally never quite as cold as I'd feared, so I could have got away with having a bit less um, in terms of maybe not even needed the down jacket, really. And um, yeah, a few other bits. But yeah, on the whole, really happy with what I took. It all mostly stood up to everything. So yeah, there we go, thank you. Just quickly talk about the food that I carried. Where I was in the villages and towns I went to, it was really just not an option to get proper hiking food and stuff like that. Your options are pretty limited. What I generally do is I'd have porridge every morning because I could always buy porridge. And with that, I would just mix in like nuts, sugar, fruit, anything to give it a bit of um, more energy and flavoring. And I'd have coffee in the morning, instant coffee. And that was dead good because I just had to boil a small amount of water. And if the water was already filtered, I wouldn't even have to fully boil it, just enough to get it hot. And then I could really save gas and um, save time as well. And for lunch, I would have like lots of Snickers bars um, because they were the only thing I could reliably find that had a lot of energy for the weight. And mixed in with that, I would just have local food. I would have like cheese and stuff that I'd get from Shepherds, bread, halva, which is like an energy packed um, kind of, I don't know what you call it, like almost like a paste, like a hard block of, um, it's kind of consistency of marzipan and it's made from seeds and stuff. And it's, yeah, like tahini almost, it's full of energy. So I'd often carry that and you can get it with raisins and nuts in. Um, I wouldn't have like a cooked dinner unless I was staying somewhere, I would just snack throughout the day. And then when I put my tent up, I would snack a lot. So yeah, that's all I did really. Um, and I'd try not to carry too much food, but it's difficult. Um, always hungry on a hike like this. Yes. So yeah, that's it. For my filming, like I think I've said, I just used my phone, my iPhone. I filmed everything on that. And one of the things I got on this trip, which hopefully, I mean, I'll see when I start editing, but I hope it's kind of improved my filming quality and let me get lots of cool shots where I'm walking and stuff. Um, it was this. This is a Ultrapod. And um, fitted to that is just this phone attachment. And this thing is wicked because you can obviously hold it and it gives you like a more steady shot or you can set it up like a tripod. And then with this Velcro strap, you can actually strap it to other things. And the main thing I'd do with that is I'd get my trekking pole and stick it in the ground and then strap this thing to the trekking pole. So then you've effectively got like a normal tripod, like a higher tripod. And that was, yeah, dead useful to get like cool shots and um, photos and everything. Yes. So for navigation, I'll show you this on my backup phone that I had. I use an amazing app called Gaia GPS. <clears throat> and this thing's really powerful and you can, you can see here some trail. So yeah, with Gaia, you can easily draw and import GPS, GPX trails. 
and it will give you even like obviously distance, ascent and descent, which is really important in a little altitude profile. Just, um, yeah, it's really useful. It's really important to me, like as I've got better at this kind of thing, I think one of the main things is quantifying how much climb and descent and what I'm expecting to cover each day. Like not just like, oh, it's probably about 10K. That didn't look too bad from the contours, but actually getting like a real terrain profile and being able to plot your route in so much detail, it's it's really important because you need to know how long it's going to take you to get somewhere, everything like that. And with Gaia, it's just super easy to do that. And then you can also print out strip maps using their website or another website called Cowtopo, which pairs really seamlessly with Gaia. And then the other amazing thing about this um, app is the map layers and how they work. So if you look here, this is one map layer I'm viewing, which has contours. But if I go on here, you can pick different ones and you can import your own custom map layers and, as well. And so you can then drag this along, for instance. And now I'm seeing the same bit of map, but with satellite imagery. And this was really important for the Caucasus because the maps generally didn't have any, didn't have much detail on them. The topographic maps for this area is the best ones are old Soviet ones. So there wasn't a lot of detail. So being able to then just look at the satellite imagery as well, it just allowed me to, to get a lot, a, a much clearer idea of what the terrain might be like where I was going. Um, like how, how forested it was and uh, water and stuff like that. And you can save all this offline as well. So you just plot an area, save the maps, and it works offline. And I can show a tutorial on that in detail, maybe, if people would be interested. Um, a lot of the techniques I've kind of picked up using this software is, yeah, you can do a lot with it. And you can plot waypoints. Oh, there's there's tons of stuff. But, yeah, that was, that was amazing. So that's how I navigated generally, just using that. So yeah, I don't think anyone ever really comes down this way because <laughs> it's just a bushwhack.